All righty. I believe it is time for us to kick this off. So we have so much to cover. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start. Feel free to keep on coming if you're waiting in line. There's lots of seats up front here. So um, yeah, welcome, welcome. Um, my name is Randy Abernathy. I'm a managing partner at RxM, and this is Kubernetes Networking 101. So um, let me just see a quick show of hands. How many people would consider themselves very savvy Kubernetes networking people? All right, so everybody else, if you saw someone raise their hand, you got questions, you know where to go, right? It's those people. Um, so yeah, this is gonna be a super fun tutorial. Um, we have 90 minutes. We have a ton of stuff to cover, and I'll just give you a quick intro to the format. Um, we have stood up uh, hundreds of machines in a cloud provider who shall remain nameless since they wouldn't sponsor us. Um, and so you guys can um, SSH into the box that you were um, provided on this sheet. Now, I realize that we're on conference Wi-Fi, right? We all know what that means. It's probably really banging great Wi-Fi, but there's 200, 300 people trying to use it all at the same time. So the, the best thing that we could do is instead of you downloading all sorts of packages and, um, and containers and stuff that would be really slow, you can just SSH to these cloud instances and send a few characters back and forth every once in a while. It's the lowest bandwidth thing that we can come up with for a session like this. It's also really great because if you completely thrash this computer, your laptop is still fine, right? So don't worry, right? It's a virtual machine. And if you do completely thrash this computer, we have spares. So um, I have three um, folks helping me today, um, Chris, Ilian, and Valentin. And Chris is, by the way, doing a talk at 1600, Coop Cuddle Said What, which is going to be super awesome. So I would go to that if I were you. Um, but those guys are going to come around and help with questions. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Those guys will be scanning the room. They'll come to you. They can give you a new machine if you need it. We got spares. Um, they can help you get unstuck if you're working on a part of the tutorial that isn't working. Um, we've tested it a bunch of times, so I feel pretty good about if you read the tutorial steps carefully and do them the way that they say, it's going to work. Um, so. Uh, Hopefully, we won't have too many problems, but we're, we're here to help. If you have any questions at all, um, feel free to ask. Yeah, question. Ah, great, great question. So when we get to the um, first lab break, I'll go into this in some more detail, but the question was, hey, um, I don't have my laptop, or my laptop's locked down, or something, and I can't get to these boxes. What do I do? Well, you can. Um, we're gonna have some slides and presentation, and I'll probably do a lot of the steps if I have time while I'm running around, so you get to see that. But also, there's instructions in the lab as to how to stand up a, a plain vanilla Ubuntu 2004 server that you can do the labs on. There's nothing special about these labs. They're just running on a plain vanilla Ubuntu 2004 server. We literally start from the absolute start, install Kubernetes, set up CNI, start creating services, install the service mesh, install the, you know, the ingress, everything is, is right in that lab. So it'll be really easy to redo later. Also, and I, and I appreciate that question because hello virtual people, all the people who are, um, oh, over here, uh, hello virtual people, all the people who are online, um, obviously you didn't get one of these sheets with an IP, uh, you know, we just, there's like 800 people or something signed up, so we couldn't do it for everybody. But if you've got a box that you can use that's a plain vanilla Ubuntu box, a VM, you can just um, either SSH into that. If it's in a data center, it's on your laptop. If it's in a cloud somewhere, that's going to work fine. Um, and there are instructions for doing exactly that in the lab. Right? The lab points you to a, a, a virtual machine setup doc, which is a markdown on GitHub, and you can follow the instructions there to run a basic VM that we already provided for you. It's just a plain vanilla Ubuntu box again, but you can stand that up and do the labs. So yeah, great questions, and I'll continue to you know, give you more information about the lab as we close in on getting started on the first step. This, this session is organized into five parts. We're going to take about 15 minutes for each part, and then I've got you know, a very tight budget here to get started. So um, we're going to do like maybe five minutes of discussion, and then 10 minutes of lab work, five minutes of discussion, 10 minutes of lab work. This is a hands-on session, right? This is a tutorial. So you're going to be doing all of this stuff. And I'm only going to give you the overview because you're going to do it, right? Why should I tell you the commands when you're going to type them yourself? So all right, so that's, uh, that's it. So for these three guys are out there uh, ready to help. Also, you'll see that there is a, a tutorial lab doc in the slide deck here. 
It's also um, on your sheet. So for the virtual people, you can get this deck off sketch. So these slides are on sketch already. So if you go to the talk, you see this, the schedule, you know, the slide link, click that, you'll get this doc. And then that link will take you to the markdown. So let me just preview that markdown for you real quick, make sure everybody is uh, able to find it. It looks like this. All right, so if you, if you follow this uh, GitHub link, it takes you to KubeCon EU 2022. So the full URL is github.com slash rx-m slash kubecon eu 2022 slash tree slash main, obviously. And then if you click on the markdown, it's just gonna open right up. That's the lab, right? And you'll notice that it's broken up into steps. So step one, our first lab session is gonna be pod networking. And that doc's not going anywhere. That'll be there forever. So you can look at that in three years if you want to. Nothing will work, I'm sure, but you can try it. Um, okay, so that's a, a bit of the startup. Hopefully now everybody's got a sheet with the IP. The other thing you're gonna need to log into the lab system, you need an IP address, right, to reach the host. And then you need to prove your identity. And so you're gonna be Ubuntu, big surprise, right? That's your user ID. And then you're gonna need a key. And that key, the link for the key is on here too. Right, so um, here's a hint also. It's the same key. <laughs> so if somebody needs help, you can log into their machine, right? We, these machines are all going away in about two hours, so. Um, all right, that's enough of the logistics. Let's talk about the talk. So our goal is to introduce the world of Kubernetes network communications in a high level but practical way. The idea of each of these little thought experiments, these little labs is, to show you how a part of the Kubernetes networking world works in enough depth that you understand it and you could walk away and go, cool, I'm not a networking person, but now I get it and it's, everything's gonna be a lot easier for me because I understand all these little parts. Or if you are interested in digging deeper, you have a beginning point, right? We've installed all the stuff, everything works together. That's a lot of the times, you know, the big time waster. Now you can get down to the business of playing with it and experimenting and taking your journey further. So that's the idea behind this session. Concepts and projects that we're gonna explore, we're gonna begin with container networking and talk about pods and how they talk together, and that is gonna involve a CNI plugin. Kubernetes doesn't, it's not opinionated, right? It doesn't come with a networking solution. It doesn't come with a container runtime. It doesn't come with storage drivers, right? You have to add all those in through the container network interface, the container runtime interface, and the container storage interface, right? Those are the three big legs of the Kubernetes stool. It's very rare to find a Kubernetes cluster that doesn't have plugins for all three of those, and sometimes multiple plugins for some of them. But to just get up and running after you've installed Kubernetes, you're gonna need a container network um, interface plugin, and we're gonna use Cilium. Cilium is a project at the CNCF, really cool um, uh, solution for networking, and we'll talk about that briefly. Then we're gonna get into step two, which is Kubernetes services. So once we've got our cluster running, and we've got the network in place, and we've seen how it works, and understand the absolute basics, we're gonna dig into services. And we're gonna see how services give us a front end for a set of dynamically changing pods. Clients don't want the heartburn of figuring out who to connect to. They want a virtual IP address that they can look up by name, that they just connect to, and then the magic happens and they get to one of the pods, right? So that's what services are all about. We're gonna look at how Kubernetes does that, at least one of the ways that it does it. And then we're gonna take a look at DNS. Um, humans don't like to remember IP addresses. Also, IP addresses tend to change a lot more than concepts. A service name is a concept. If you have a um, you know, CFO reporting service, it's probably gonna be called CFO reporting forever or for a very long time and anywhere you put it. But if you deploy that in Singapore, it's gonna have one IP. If you deploy that in London, it's gonna have another IP. So services use these names to create an abstraction, again, another level of abstraction on top of that virtual IP. And we're gonna see how Kubernetes implements DNS and it does it in some interesting and creative ways. One thing that's fundamental that we're gonna hammer on a little bit are concepts around Kubernetes. You'll never understand Kubernetes networking if you don't understand Kubernetes. Kubernetes thinks about the world a certain way. You don't have to deploy applications that way. But if you don't understand it, you're gonna keep stepping into potholes. 
If you understand it, you can protect yourself and say, well, Kubernetes wants this to be this way, but we're going to change it a little bit, and we're going to make sure we've done the correct things to keep Kubernetes happy when we do it slightly differently from how Kubernetes expects. And this really applies to networking, and we're going to see some of this in the DNS section. Um, next, we're going to do step four, which is outside access. We're going to see how from a cluster where you've got all your cool services running, you can get from the outside in. And there's a lot of ways to do that, but fundamentally, there's two simple paths. And there's lots of other crazy stuff that people are marketing and trying to tell you do all this. There's two paths. Under the covers of all these things, there's two ways in. And so we're going to look at that, and we're going to talk about some of the cool projects that fit in there. Um, in addition to core DNS on the DNS side, we're going to look at emissary for ingress and gateway kinds of functions. Um, Envoy is a proxy that emissary uses under the covers. And then we're going to look at, um, well, we're going to talk about Metal LB. Um, the, uh, sometimes when we do this talk, we run Metal LB, but with this many people, in the, it would be crazy. So we're not going to do that. But we'll talk about it a little bit. And then finally, we're going to get into Service Mesh, step five. This is sort of the pinnacle, right? After you've got everything else working perfectly, that's when you might want to start thinking about Service Mesh. Not everybody needs a Service Mesh. Uh, I don't buy that. Not everybody needs a Service Mesh. However, a service mesh is an incredibly powerful and valuable thing, and so you might need it. You might want it. It can be an incredibly valuable tool. We're going to talk about what service meshes do, and we're going to use the only graduated project in the CNCF ecosystem that is a service mesh, Linkerd. And um, it's a super cool project, has a ton of amazing features, and will just scratch the surface in this session. But you'll have it installed. You'll see how easy it is to fire up and you'll know the basics so you can, again, carry on your journey and explore Linkerd all you want after the fact. OK, so that is our plan. Now let's see how we do. Uh, I'm going to quickly switch over here. Uh, we have burned 10 minutes. Yikes, OK, we got to get going. All right, so step one. And re remember, if you've got questions, there's three guys, right? Chris, Ilian, and Valentin out here that will help you out. So just raise your hand, and they'll come and answer your questions while I keep going to keep us on track. All right, so container networking concepts. Let's talk about this just briefly. Um, the, the first thing I want to say is there's no such thing as a container. Maybe that's a little shocking in a container-based convention. But there really isn't, right? The Linux kernel has C groups. What do they do? They are control groups. They control how much memory or CPU you can use. The Linux kernel has namespaces. What do they do? They isolate what your process can see. Can your process only see itself and its children, or can it see the PIDs of other processes? That's the PID namespace. But what we care about is the network namespace. A network namespace makes it so that a process can have its own virtual copy of the IP stack. Inside what we think of as a container, you have your own route table, your own IP tables, your own uh, interfaces, loopback, and things like that. So that's really useful because now we can reliably deploy things that listen on port 80 many, many times on the same computer because they all have their own interfaces. So this is magic, right? If we had a big cluster of machines and we wanted to dynamically roll out applications, if they're all fighting for ports and craziness like that, that would be pretty tough. So what ends up happening with container tech is you get reliable deployment. That's a really huge thing. But we need something to sort of do the deployment, right? To make the, uh, the deployment work. And that's where Kubernetes comes in. And Kubernetes, there's no such thing as a container. What Kubernetes does is it takes container images, which are just little tar balls with root file systems in them, and it runs several of them in the same network namespace. That bundle is called a pod, right? They share the network namespace. They also share the interprocess communications namespace. We want it to be cheap for them to talk to each other, right? So if you're using MQs or uh, shared memory, stuff like that, those are in the IPC namespace. And if you're using the local loopback and stuff like that, that's in the network namespace. So pods are collections of container images that are all running in shared network namespaces. So in Kubernetes, interestingly, the pod is the unit of distribution. It's the smallest thing you can schedule it's the smallest thing that you can scale, and they're atomic. You can't run part of it on one machine and part of it on another, right? So really what we're thinking about when we move to Kubernetes is not container networking. It's pod networking. And so pod networking works like this. You have an interface in one pod and an interface in another pod. They both have IP addresses, and now you can talk. 
right? These, these two guys can communicate with each other. And you can have as many containers as you like in the first pod and as many containers as you like in the second pod or as few as you like. So pods are the, the, the unit of distribution and also the unit of network identity, right? The unit of networking, they have an IP address. Interestingly enough, the pods need to be able to communicate with each other. That's what Kubernetes says. All pods in a Kubernetes cluster must be able to communicate with each other. Right? Now, the world's changing. There's lots of exceptions to the rule. But as far as you know, your basic network requirements to, for Kubernetes to function the way that it's supposed to, all the pods have to be able to talk to each other. Now, what if I want to put some pods in the staging namespace, and I don't want them talking to pods in the production namespace? Well, you can create network policies that you know, change the rules up and stuff, but it has to be possible for every pod to talk to every other pod. What that means is that pods need to be able to communicate with each other when they're on different machines. Linux has stuff built into it, like Linux Bridge and things like that, that acts like a virtual switch where all the pods can talk to each other and you don't really need any extra software. But as soon as you start communicating outside of the computer to another computer, something's got to happen, right? Because these pods, it's, in the old days, we might put a piece of software on there and then we might go and program the network a while and now everybody knows where it is. That's not gonna fly in Kubernetes, right? Where we're deploying nine times a day, 10 times a day, pods are scaling up and scaling down all day long. That's not gonna fly. It's gotta be automated. So we need software-defined networking. But the problem is if Kubernetes just said, yeah, supply some software-defined networking thing, it wouldn't work because you know, Kubernetes would be integrating with 50,000 different things. And so the CNI is a standard that makes it possible for Kubernetes to make the requests that it wants to make, like, hey, I've started up a pod and I created a network namespace for it, but it's plain vanilla. There's no interfaces, there's no rules, there's no routes, there's nothing in there. So hey, Mr. Software Defined Networking thing, please wire this pod up so that it can talk to other pods on this computer and any pod in the entire cluster. So the CNI um, solutions generally have at least one and sometimes two components. The first component is a daemon set pod that runs on every node in the cluster and handles the, you know, the organization of all the pods on that cluster. And then sometimes there's a control plane too. But those CNI components make it possible for pods to reach each other when they're on different hosts. And they can do that in lots of different ways. They can just use routes, right? You can give every host a subnet and then the, you know, the, the plugins can discover each other's subnets through lots of ways, gossip, or they could use etcd to save all that information. And then once they get a, 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 an outbound connection, they can say, oh yeah, that IP address I know is on that host, so I'll just route the traffic. They don't have to encapsulate it or do anything like that. On the other hand, it's nice sometimes to encapsulate the traffic because if you do, then you can do things like encrypt it on the wire, you can do things like um, make sure that the, uh, the underlying network doesn't know that there are pods, right? It just sees two hosts talking to each other instead of a bunch of, you know, 20 different IP addresses from one computer. If you try that on a cloud provider, they're probably gonna kill your traffic. They're gonna go, hey, you know, that machine, I know its IP address is .7, and I see all these crazy source IPs coming out of that box. There's an attacker in there trying to spoof, right? And so, of course, you have to go to the cloud provider and change settings to make all this stuff work. If you just don't want to have to worry about that, if you want something that's totally portable and goes from your bare metal environment to your cloud to somewhere else, um, then an overlay could be better, right? So there's pros and cons to everything. There's no one right answer. But in the case of a lot of these plugins, you have choice. So we're gonna talk about Cilium for just a sec and we're gonna use it in the first lab. Cilium is a CNI plugin that gives us options. And it is um, kind of in, in, the, in the new generation of CNIs that are trying to leverage eBPF. So there's a, a way to tell the Linux kernel to run little programs um, and therefore it's very fast because you don't have a user mode component constantly you know, messing around with the network traffic. And so that's exactly how Cilium works. It uses eBPF, leverages that. And Cilium gives you the ability to use an overlay network so you can tunnel the traffic between the hosts where the, 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 the network underneath doesn't see the pod traffic, it just sees host talking, or you can route the traffic. Um, it's up to you, Cilium gives you some flexibility and it is a, a really cool CNCF project with a bunch of neat features. So we're gonna use that as our CNI plugin and that's gonna give us this. Now, you all have one node. 
right? We already have like 400 computers stood up, so it would have been 800 and it just keeps going from there. So we're gonna do everything on a single node Kubernetes cluster, but it's gonna work exactly the same as if you had 100 nodes. And that's the important thing, and that's what Kubernetes and CNI brings to the table anyway. So if you had two hosts, for example, the hosts have interfaces and the pods have interfaces, and the, the CNI is the thing that takes care of making sure the traffic can get back and forth. All right, cool. So we've um, sort of disambiguated CNI. We've talked about some of the solutions. There's lots of other really cool CNI plugins, by the way. Um, Weave is another one that we use a lot at RxM because it's just super easy to install. Um, Calico is probably one of the most popular ones out there that a lot of people use as well, and it, the, the list goes on. So there's many, many options, and they all have different pros and cons. But what we're going to do now is we are going to switch to lab mode. And that link I put in the presentation, again, up here. So you have it on your sheet, but you also have it up there, right? And there's, um, there's a backup link, too, if you, for some reason, can't get to GitHub. I thought the reason we did the backup link is GitHub got flaky for the, me this morning. And I was like, whoa, you know, somebody attacking GitHub, that would be terrible. And so we put a, a backup link. But I would just use the, the GitHub link, because if you do, you're going to get a nice formatted you know, web page that you can just follow. And, and copy and paste from. Now, one thing I want to mention is in the instructions, it's walking you through all the steps, right? So it says, hey, do this, right? And then it says, hey, do this. But some of these things say, hey, do this, and it's specific to your computer, right? For example, if you create a pod through a deployment, that pod is going to have an IP address that is unique um, to your setup. Right? And another example here, pinging an IP. Right? Anytime you see an IP, you've got to ask yourself the question, what IP should I be putting in there? Because it's not the one in the sheet. Right? The, the, the lab is an example, and then you're going to have to make some interpolations. Usually it'll tell you. Right? It says right here, you know, um, note, you know, um, there are lots of different machines. Use your IP address, you know, that sort of thing. All right, so, um, so yeah, so that's lab step one. It's going to have you, um, let me just uh, kind of walk through it real quick. You can start right now if you want. Um, so open this document up, you can read this little top section, and then it walks you through SSHing into the lab system, right? It literally explains how to log in to the lab system with SSH if you've never done that before. Here's the link that I was mentioning that can give you SSH help if you need that. And here's the link that shows you how to stand up one of these Ubuntu boxes on your own laptop so you can run the labs later if you want to do that. Right? So once you've done this, it has you install Kubernetes. We built a really cool little script that does everything except set up the CNI plugin. So we're just going to run that. That's going to take a minute or two. So start that now if you, if you can. And then um, you're going to see uh, the status of your nodes. You're going to realize you need a CNI plugin. We're going to add Cilium. We're going to play around with it a little bit. And then we're going to poke around under the covers and see how our pods work and how the IP addresses are getting assigned. And um, really just look at the whole IP space. And then we'll clean up at the end. And so step two is services. I will indeed um, be breaking again for services in a little bit, but um, if you get to the end of this lab and we're not back into the discussion, keep going, right? Drill into the services. It's okay to get ahead because I'm pretty sure you're going to be behind at some point in this session. So um, yeah, SSH into your lab in instance, install Kubernetes, set up CNI, and then explore the pod network. Have fun. Holler if you have questions. And I am, for the people who are virtual and who don't have laptops, I'm going to probably do these steps you know, real quickly on, on the overhead so you can just see them. All right, let me, uh, let, me, let me look at the time, too. OK, what are we talking about here? So it is 11.23. So this, this one uh, might take a little bit of time. I'm going to give everybody till, say, 11.30, and then we'll do a check-in. All right.
Obviously, you can use any, you know, SSH client you like. I'm using MobXterm, which I love, and if you want to use PuTTY, there's a PPK up there as well in the keys, and I think it's on the sheet if you need it. Hey, Valentin. Hey, Valentin. How many do we have left? Do we have a lot left? Yeah. Oh, cool. All right. All right, I just started the Kubernetes install on my, well, I just grabbed a sheet just like you guys. So I'm SSH'd in. I'm running the Kubernetes install. It's installing Docker first. We're using Docker. That's the runtime. Um, why Docker? Docker's a poor choice for production, not because Docker isn't amazing, Docker is amazing, it's just giant, and it has all sorts of stuff in it that you don't want in your production environment. If you're a developer, or if you're experimenting, you want Docker, because it's awesome. It has all sorts of cool tools and features and techniques that you can use for debugging and experimenting and exploring. So that's why we use Docker here. Um, we just install Docker, and then we install the Docker shim, which no longer comes with Kubernetes, so you have to do both steps. Docker is getting installed, then the Docker shim's getting installed. Then we're going to install Kubernetes latest, which is 1.23. You might also ask, what distribution of Kubernetes are we using? And the answer is none. We're just using upstream Kubernetes. Plain vanilla, 100%, completely compatible, the Kubernetes. And we're using kubeadm to install it, which is the reference installer. It's the node installer that runs underneath like kubespray and stuff like that. So no, no special gimmicks in our clusters, just the basics. And the stuff we add, which is gonna be a lot. Running this script is the thing that takes the longest, so everything else is a lot shorter after this. And if you think about it, you know, you're installing an entire Kubernetes cluster from nothing, so that's not bad, it's just a minute or two there. Just look at my node, it's not ready. It's not ready because I don't have a CNI solution. So I'm gonna read on in the lab. Lab tells me your node's not ready. Now we're gonna install Cilium. This is gonna make our node ready. And there's three steps here, which is, you know, I, I like to do everything kind of old school, so you can see what's happening. We're downloading a tarball, right? That's the first piece. And then once we've got the tarball downloaded, we have to extract it. And that's gonna give us the Cilium CLI. So a lot of these, you know, kind of modern projects for Kubernetes use the operator pattern where they actually have a, um, maybe a, a command line tool, and then they run a service in Kubernetes that you can interact with, which is nice because you can get data and things from it. And then that service is responsible for actually deploying the, the pods that are doing the thing you're trying to do. So I have the Cilium CLI installed now. I got my version information, but there's no Cilium on my cluster. If I go back and do a get node, you know, still not ready. So I have to tell Cilium to install the CNI plugin. And that's the last step here before we are up and running. 
These guys, of course, have all sorts of crazy icons in their output, which is cute. Of course, every time you do one of these things, containers are being downloaded, right? Because everything runs in containers. Kubernetes eats its own dog food in so far as it's possible when kubeadm installs things anyway the control plane runs in containers in pods so you have the scheduler in a pod you have the controller manager in a pod you have the kube proxy in a prod the the node agent the kubelet can't run in a pod because it's the thing that creates the pods but beyond that everything's in a pod so now that we've got cilium up and running um, we can do some things like ask it status all right, this is the nice thing about having a CLI and a control plane. We get all sorts of pretty colors, and so it looks, looks good, right? We have the operator running, and we have a single node, so we have a single Cilium you know, agent running. Um, if we were running you know, 40 nodes, because it's a daemon set, it would run on every single node, and there'd be 40 of them. But we only have one node, so we only have one of the Cilium plugins. All right. And then it just has you look around and explore the network a little bit. Make sure traffic is going back and forth. Has us run a little pod and verify that we can get to it. Let me do that real quick. Use the kubectl run command, which essentially creates a manifest behind the scenes and applies it to the cluster. So. This one's gonna create a pod called web with the image HTTPD and defaults for everything else. And then we can take a look at this guy. Output wide and kubectl get pod is gonna show us um, the IP of the pod. And that way we can test it. All right, patchy up and running. Thank you. Some more exploration goes on. We get a chance to take a look at the Cilium config and I'll just run a couple more of these commands. All right, so this is the pool of IP addresses that's going to be handed out to our pods. The lab kind of walks you through the different pools, right? We have the internet where everything goes except some reserved address ranges. Then you have your cloud host machines, which are probably using some reserve, one of those reserved ranges. And then you have the pod network, which is inside that cloud. And so these things all need to not conflict, right? You don't want to conflict with the public IP address because they might need to reach you or vice versa. You could proxy them, but, um, and you don't want to conflict with the host IPs. That would be confusing. And then the pod IP space is also going to need to be unique. When you set up your cluster, you can specify the IP range for services, as we'll see in a minute. But it's the CNI that decides what IP address your pod gets. That's why it's set up here in the CNI function. So if you wanted a different range, you'd have to tell Cilium when you installed it. And if you do a Cilium install minus minus help, it'll dump out a gajillion options that you can use. And there's also a config that you can set and apply in kind of a more infrastructure as code approach. All right, and so we test the pod network out, do a couple more things, and then finally we uh, clean up at the end. I didn't actually create the client, but I'm gonna go ahead and just delete the web guy and call it a day here. Step one done for me. Let me just do a quick show of hands. If you're, if you're still working, great. Um, how many people have finished with step one though? Okay, great, let's move on. Um, if you're still working, that's great. Don't, you know, don't feel slow. You're probably going really fast, actually. Um, but we're going to try to keep on the clock here. So, so give me half an ear while you keep working if you want to. Um, this is a tutorial. It's all about the hands-on. So you know, if, you, if you have a choice between ignoring me and um, you know, doing, doing the lab and not ignoring me, I would ignore me. Um, so Kubernetes service communications. Let's take a look at how Kubernetes thinks about services. When you are running pods, let's think about Kubernetes 1.0. Kubernetes 1.0 was for microservices, period, end of story. 
There were no, 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 no real provisions for any kind of stateful workloads. Cassandra is not a microservice, right? It is a clustered storage engine where you run many, many nodes and it's horizontally scalable and it's absolutely a, a cloud-friendly kind of data store, but it's not a microservice. Microservices are stateless. State is hard. Scaling your Cassandra cluster, sizing it, doing all those things is hard. But running a microservice is easy. And destroying it when you have seven others shouldn't ripple the waters at all. Nobody should care. You get disconnected, you reconnect, and you end up with one of the other guys, and they're all the same. That's what microservices are all about. And so Kubernetes embraces this. And so we can run a whole bunch of copies of our service under a deployment in Kubernetes. And then to avoid customers having to worry about the mayhem of pods scaling up and down and getting deleted because a node is overloaded or whatever, we put a service in front of it. And that service has a head, a cluster IP, a virtual IP address. It's not associated with any interface. It's just an IP. And when you try to connect to it, the Linux kernel has to figure out what to do because that, uh, that address isn't associated with anything. There's nowhere to send the packets, right? And so um, Kubernetes implements the routing functionality, the forwarding functionality that makes that all work. When you create a service, you get a cluster IP and you get the wiring that delivers your connection to one of those backend pods. So how do we make that go? Well, there's a thing called the kube proxy. It runs in a pod as a daemon set on every node in the cluster. And it's doing that stuff. Its job is every time a service is created, so it's watching the API server saying, hey, tell me about any services. And when a service gets created, it immediately goes and tells the Linux kernel, do all this stuff, right? And now all of a sudden, people can reach those pods through those services. And when pods come and go, the kube proxy is watching that too. If a pod goes away, he takes that pod out of the mesh. If a pod shows up and has the right label, he adds that pod into the mesh. So the kube proxy is, is the magic. Now, how does the kube proxy make this work? Well, the slowest way is it can do user mode. But this is deprecated and you know, this was used in the early beta days of Kubernetes where the traffic would literally connect to the proxy and then the proxy would make the connection outbound for you. So that's no good because now you've got a user mode process and your data path is going to be slow. So the next thing we can do is use IP tables. We just tell the kernel, hey, when somebody connects to this IP address, use a destination network address translation to one of these pods. And a lot of people don't, don't know it, but you can randomly select a rule in a chain of of rules in IP tables, and that's what's happening, right? So if there's 20 services back there, it's just gonna randomly select one of them and then send you to that guy. So it's load balancing, right? It's random, but it's load balancing. And if pods are coming and going like crazy, and one of the pods gets overloaded, that pod's likely to be evicted, and all those connections are gonna break, and they're gonna redistribute immediately because the clients are gonna reconnect. If you're talking to a microservice, you should expect it to be ephemeral. Right? Note to people writing client code, expect that connection to break. Don't be surprised by it. When it does, you just reconnect and you're going to get distributed to somebody else. So the entropy of the cluster naturally distributes the load pretty darn well. A lot of people are like, you know, let's use some sophisticated global rate limit, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the day, try it. Try the simple stuff first. It's often fastest, right? Um, but if that doesn't work for you, um, there's other options. Now, one thing that probably is an upgrade is IPVS. So the kernel has also another mechanism, IP virtual services, and it's a little bit, a teeny bit faster than IP tables um, in some situations and a lot faster in some others because it uses a lot less resources. That's the main thing. Ta IP tables were never meant to be, you know, distributing traffic. So IPVS is probably the better option. You can tell Proxy which of these modes you want to use, and the default is IP tables. So that's the one that we're using in our lab because we didn't tell it to do anything else, right? Um, there are also CNI plugins that have fancy features too because eBPF, hey, programming the kernel sounds like that would be a way to handle these services too, right? Well, it is, and it has some benefits. Um, so some of the plugins let you do that. You could replace the Cube proxy with, the, with Cilium if you wanted to and let it do all that stuff. We didn't tell it to do that again, so it didn't, but that's an option that's on the table. Now remember that all of the hosts in your cloud, virtual private cloud, right, have to have unique addresses if they're going to talk to each other. So all your Kubernetes cluster nodes have to have unique addresses. And 
then all of the pods that run in them have to have unique addresses. And since you need to be able to get to the pods from the host in order to you know, do things like check their health and stuff, you know, those addresses have to be unique, right? Non-overlapping. And then the last thing is these service IPs need to be unique and non-overlapping. So we have three address spaces we got to think about when we're setting up Kubernetes. This is part of the architecting a cluster process, right? What are the address ranges we're going to use for, for these things? And another interesting thing is the uh, support for IPv4 and IPv6. We're doing everything in IPv4 no, for no reason. It's just what happens by default, right? This is the way things work by default. But out there on the internet, IPv6 continues to gain steam. A lot of companies, especially telcos, are IPv6 internally everywhere. And so there's, there's a, a good momentum towards IPv6. In Kubernetes 1.0, it was IPv4. That was the end of the story. Next, IPv6 only went GA in 118, right? That was a long time later. And you had one or the other, right? No, not both. You could pick one, right? And this is, this is as far as what Kubernetes is responsible for, so the, the cluster IPs, right? If you had a CNI plugin that knew how to do IPv6, well, knock yourself out. That's fine. But the services are always going to be IPv4 or IPv6 until um, 1.20, where we got either IPv4 or IPv6 in the same cluster. Right? Now you could pick. You could have an IPv4 service over here and an IPv6 over here. Pretty cool. But you still couldn't have a dual stack service, right? That was out of bounds until da -da, one, two, three. Three weeks ago or whatever it was, we now have GA, IPv4, IPv6 dual stack. So you can pick um, on a cluster to make a service single stack. You can make it prefer dual stack. And then you can require dual stack. And that means that the, the users got to um, have both, right? So those are, um, those are, those are pretty cool um, features. The Kubernetes project is really stunning how fast it moves and how much tech is in it when you look at all the different places and how advanced it is. So some things are a long time coming. That maybe was, but hey, it's here now. Services. How do we create one? Well, in Kubernetes, you pretty much create everything by specifying it and giving the specification to Kubernetes, and then Kubernetes just spends the rest of its life trying to make the status of the cluster the same as your specifications. That's what Kubernetes does. It makes the status of the cluster the same as your specifications. That way, you don't have to constantly get up in the middle of the night and say, oh, that pod stopped? Let me restart it. No, you said, I want a pod running, and if it stops, Kubernetes restarts it. Self-healing, you know, all these types of you know, automate the toil, SRE stuff. So this is a service. It's a very simple one. It has a name, web. It has a port, 80. Uh, the port has a name, too. And in case you have multiple ports, you can use SRV records and DNS to discover which ones are which and stuff. And then we have a selector that says, hey, um, any pod that has the label key app value web gets these, this traffic. Right? So if there's 100 of them, you'll have 100 of those pods getting connections when this service is hit. If there's one of them, then that, that one will get it. If there's none, then you can't connect. There's no such thing as a virtual IP, right? It's virtual. It's just rules in a table or something like that. So if there aren't any pods, you're not going to go any further. All right. So that's the idea behind a service. Now, all of the pods that match that selector create something called an endpoint. Right? The, the service could push all the pod information that match the service down to all the cube proxies. But that'd be very expensive, because you can have clusters with thousands and thousands of pods. Right? And so what's better is to just create a little thing that has the IP address, and, and that's about it, right? an endpoint that identifies the targets that you want, and then you send those down to the cube proxy. So earlier I said, hey, the cube proxy is watching the pods. It, it, it's actually looking for endpoints, right? And so the, the, the service controller is creating the endpoints, and then the, the queue proxy is getting those. So an endpoint looks like this up here. What happens if you create a service that has no selector? That service will never, ever identify any pods to send traffic to. So you're going to have to do it. And this is something that you might do in a scenario where those, po those, those pods aren't pods. What if you have 16 VMs? And every once in a while, some of them shut down and some new ones stand up. You could create your own glue to create these endpoints. And because the endpoint is named website, we know it's a sub-resource of the service website. And then it's got an address and the ports, just like we you know, had before defined on the, on the service side. And then next thing you know, 
you look at the endpoints for your service, and this guy shows up if you apply that endpoint. So you can create your own endpoints. You can have them produced dynamically by Kubernetes. So in general, if the, you're you know, routing to pods, you would want them dynamically created. Now, what kinds of services do we have to work with? There's a bunch. The first kind is a headless service. A headless service has no cluster IP. You literally say cluster IP none. It actually turns out it's a cluster IP type of service with no cluster IP. I don't know how that works, but anyway. Um, you define a headless service by creating a cluster IP service with no cluster IP. What is that good for? It's good for situations where the pods aren't the same. What if one of your pods is a Kafka pod and it has the topic NASDAQ? And what if the other of your pods is a Kafka pod and it has on it the topic New York Stock Exchange? And another pod has um, life and so on, right? Well, you can't connect to the life pod if you want to get the New York Stock Exchange data. They have identity, these pods. They're not microservices. So anytime you have a situation where they're not microservices, but you want DNS resolution and stuff like that, this is the kind of service you want. Next, cluster IP. Cluster IP is for microservices, right? Where it just sends the traffic. That's the first example we looked at. Um, node port is another one where if, if packets are coming in from the outside world and we want them to be delivered to our service, we can use a port on every node, on every host in the cluster, and, and have that port forward to our service. So that, that port is reserved for us in the entire cluster. So obviously the, the control plane needs to know what port range you want to use, and it needs to be in control of which ports are handed out and so on. So we'll look at node port a little bit more later. Load balancer is like node port, except it also stands up an external load balancer. This requires a plugin, right? We have to have some sort of external thing like a, um, you know, an Azure load balancer or a Google Cloud network load balancer or something you know, to interact with, or at Metal LB, as we were looking at earlier. And then lastly, we have external name. This is for scenarios where you have a service name that you want to be resolvable inside your cluster. And we're going to look at DNS more in the next module, but you actually want it to look for some name that's outside your cluster, right? So you're going to make a, a name mapping, and you can do that with external name. All right, so lab step two. We're going to create a deployment, which is going to have several pods. We're going to create a cluster IP service. We're going to connect to the service, see the traffic, reach the deployment, and come back. And then we're going to figure out how it works. We're going to get under the covers, look at the IP tables, poke around a little bit, and see how things are happening. OK, so we are uh, looking at. Uh, 11.47, how is that possible? Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's give everybody, say, um, eight minutes. We'll come back at 55 minutes after. Nothing to install in this session, so. But there is a lot of stuff to look at. So 11.55, and we will be coming back. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do this second step for people virtual, just so you can get an idea of what's happening here and I'll talk through it. But for the people locally, you can just ignore me and work on the lab yourself. Um, so first thing we're going to do is we need some pods to connect to. So we're going to create a deployment with three replicas, and it's just going to run the Apache web server. So we do that. OK, cool. If I can type. All right, good. We got our three pods up and running. Now we're going to um, go ahead and show the labels on these pods. And when you create a deployment using that imperative technique, which is that's just quick and dirty, right? Normally, you'd create a manifest. But when you use that technique, you're going to get a label, key, app, and a value, which is the name of the deployment. So I can predict that, right? I know I'm going to have this app website label. I don't know what the name of the pod's going to be, because they're ephemeral. They come and go. and they're identity lists, right? I shouldn't care about the name, but I know that they're part of this website you know, package. All right, so the next thing I want to do is I want to create a cluster IP service, and we're going to do this. This is basically the exact same service we just looked at in the slides. All right, drop that in there. All right. OK, 
QCTO get all. Doesn't get everything, but it gets most of the stuff you care about. So I got my three pods. I have the replica set under the deployment. So the deployment created the replica set for me. And then I've got my service website, and it has a cluster IP. So that was handed to me by Kubernetes. Kubernetes decides what that's going to be because Kubernetes has the service controller and it also um, knows what the range of addresses that you want to use are. Now, if we had used kubeadm with the config file or given, given it the right command line parameters, we could have changed that to use something else if we wanted to. All right, so I'm going to curl that and it works, but I have no idea which pod I hit and I don't care. They're all the same. They're replicas. That's the point. All right, so there's some other good stuff in here. And then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to look for the range that Kubernetes is using. So this is that service controller IP range, right? That's where the, the, um, the IP addresses are coming from for these services. So it's a 1096 stroke 12 is what the default is. You could change it. OK, uh, a little bit more poking around. And now we're going to look at some endpoints. So let's take a look at the endpoints for the website. And we can see there's three of them, right? 1015, um, 10154, and 1054. And remember, they're always going to have the same, you know, first three octets because the hosts are subnetted at 24 bits, and then the, the overall space is 8 bits. We saw that in CNI. So these are CNI controlled, right, by Cilium, and then the service IP, the cluster IP, is controlled by Kubernetes because it's the service controller piece. All right, good. Let's see what else we got here. So the next thing we're going to do is try to figure out how this all works. So we're going to look into the IP tables, and we're going to look for the cluster IP. Obviously, I can't use the one from the lab. I have to use the one that I got, which is potentially very different. Um, service IPs aren't doled out sequentially because then you could predict what the next one would be, and that leaves you open to some security issues, so they're randomly selected from the range. All right, so I can see that there's an IP uh, tables rule that says if TCP traffic comes from anywhere and goes to that address on TCP port 80, use that chain to figure out what happens. So the next thing I need to do is I need to update my grep to look at the chain called this. And Actually, oh, yeah, there we go. And so that, that is pointing us at our service. And you can see here, this guy says, all right, um, destination IP 80. This guy here. There we go. And so those are the three pods that we saw in our deployment. And you can see, if you look at the packet counts, and I'll, of course, tell which one you hit when you did your curl, right? It's this bottom guy, as it turns out. So it's just a random probability, 33% when there's three of them, 50% when there's two of them, and then the last one's the default. And so this is the guy that got hit. And so if I look for the pod that's uh, 10.0.0.54, and I look at that guy's logs, right? So this is 54 down here. So let's look at the logs of this guy. We'll see a bunch of stuff, but there's the hit, All right? That was our curl. And then if we do the same thing and look at logs for anybody with the label app website, oh, wow. There we go. We can see that there are no hits anywhere in here except this one from our curl. So all three of the other pods, right? This guy, no hits. This guy, no hits. This guy got a hit. So the service is working, right? 
Our IP tables are solving the problem of randomly distributing traffic to our pods on the back end. And there's a little bit more exploration that goes on there. But that brings us down to the bottom section where we get to delete some things and see how stuff works. So for example, I'm just gonna pick one of these guys at random and delete it. And a bunch of things happen when you do this. Um, number one, the curl keeps working and you never even see any hesitation. And the reason is that the service proxy has taken the deleted pod out of the mesh. And of course, what also happens is that Kubernetes immediately realizes that there aren't three pods anymore. And since the replica set and the deployment were set to have three, it creates a brand new one. It's not the same pod, right? That guy, if you uh, look at the IP, Right, not the same pod, right? This guy is 134 and he's been running for 31 seconds versus the other guys which are seven minutes. So the mesh is dynamic, right? It's m taking advantage of this dynamic environment and automatically updating all of the routing or forwarding necessary to make things go. All right, so let's, um, let's move on. And, and keep in mind, if you're, if you're done with two before I move on, feel free to move on your, yourself. Um, all right, so Kubernetes DNS. Let's talk about DNS briefly and um, how Kubernetes implements it. If you're still working on lab two, keep working, just lend me half an ear. So DNS and Kubernetes. There are three files that your containers get that come from the container runtime, not from your pot your image, your container image. They're always overlaid by the container runtime. And the reason is, if you take a HTTP container and you run it in Singapore, it's gonna get one IP. If you run it in London, it's gonna get another IP. So how could you possibly create an Etsy host file with the correct information, right? Since it should have your IP and your host name in there. How could you possibly create a host name file with the correct information since the name of your host when you're a pod is the name of your pod. And that's dynamically being created. So you don't even know what it's gonna be. And then the final thing is resolve.conf. Every Kubernetes cluster runs core DNS by default. Some distros change it and use something else and some distros configure core DNS in different ways. But there is a DNS server built into Kubernetes and when you use the reference installer, kubeadm, you get core DNS, which is another CNCF project, one of the earliest ones. And so core DNS will automatically resolve service names inside your cluster to their virtual IPs so that you can just use names instead of IPs, which is great. But that means those three files have to be you know, correctly configured. And so it's the kubelet that understands your Kubernetes environment and sets these files up so that your pod works. And so you have um, you know, uh, core DNS running in the kube system namespace. As you can see up here, we have two pods, core DNS pods. So if one of them crashes, we have resilience, right? Kubernetes eats its own dog food. Core DNS runs in a deployment. And then there's a service also that gives us a cluster IP for DNS inside Kubernetes, and it's 10.96.0.10. That's the default IP for DNS, and it's gonna be injected into every single pod in resolve.conf, because when your pod tries to look up a name, it needs to go to core DNS to find the IP of that service, right? We don't generally look at pods, right? They're ephemeral, they're, 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 we don't care about them. We care about the API that we're trying to consume, right? The interface, not the implementation, and so, that's a quick look at core DNS and how it's set up and what it does. And then um, if you want to think about DNS inside a cluster, number one, you might have many clusters. So you can give every single cluster its own suffix, right? Cluster.local is the default. And so you get cluster.local in the example we're gonna look at. Next, there's the service bucket where services live. There's some other buckets, but this is the most important one. And then Namespaces are a thing in Kubernetes, right? If I want dev and production, if I want team A and team B, if I want um, you know, uh, blue, green, whatever, different namespaces are isolated from each other. And so if you create a service called Fred and I try to create one and I get an error, that's gonna be confusing, right? If, you're, if we're in completely different departments and contexts and we don't even normally talk to each other, that's gonna be a big problem. So namespaces give you the ability to create any name you want, which means the DNS has to be isolated. And so the namespace is in the DNS name. And then finally, you have the name of the service itself. So 
an example of a realistic production DNS name for a service in Kubernetes might be web, if your service is called web, production, if your namespace is called production, .svc, and then kates54.rx-m.com if that's the suffix you gave that cluster. And so you can see with this kind of a unique name, I could actually reach a service in a completely different cluster, right? I could give the name of the service, the namespace in the cluster, the SVC, and then the cluster suffix. And as long as my networking, normal, you know, computer networking infrastructure knows how to deliver that packet to that cluster, we've got con connectivity. So headless services are another thing we mentioned. If you say cluster IP none, you'll get a headless service. Well, what happens in a headless service? In a headless service, you don't want the cluster IP. You don't want to look that up because it's no good, right? You don't want to randomly go somewhere. If I want New York data, I have to talk to that Kafka node. If I want life data, I got to talk to that Kafka node. So in a headless service, you get the actual IPs of all of the nodes or all the pods when you look up the service name. So it's not just one IP of the head of the cluster IP. You're going to get all the pod IPs together. Uh, the other thing that is important is that there's a special controller for stateful pods called a stateful set. And it creates pods with deterministic names, with identity, with persistent identity. If this pod, which is, let's call, let's call it Web7, gets evicted from a computer, we won't get Web58 over here. We'll get Web7 again over here. It might have a different IP, but the name will be the same. So if you create a stateful set of Redis, the pods will be called Redis0, Redis1, Redis2 with an ordinal as they get created. So you can predict the name, and that name will be persistent. It won't go away. In other words, the Kafka guy that's servicing the NASDAQ market data, um, when it crashes, it's going to fire back up over here, and it's going to still be Kafka 7 with the NASDAQ data. And the volume it was using is going to chase it if it's network attachable. So that's what we want in a stateful set. And so if I need to look up Kafka 7, I don't want to fix myself on the IP. What if he get, gets punted to a new machine and gets a different IP? I want to use the DNS name, right? I want to be abstract from the machinery of the networking. And so I could say, hey, redis1.redis.dataNS, uh, which is my namespace, um, service cluster local, let's say that's the guy who has the NASDAQ data, then I would just connect to that guy every time. And I would always get the NASDAQ data. So that's what a headless service brings to the table. It creates this DNS structure for stateful pods. And generally, that's why you use a headless service when you have stateful pods. And so overriding um, the DNS is also possible. What if you're an administrator and you have to run a pod and that pod needs to talk to an external DNS system? You don't want it going to the internal one. You want it going to the external one. You can set up your resolve.conf as custom as you like. A resolve.conf is generally going to have a name server to connect to, searches, so suffixes that you would add, right? If I look for web, it's going to work. Why? Because there's a suffix in there that is going to specify my namespace dot service dot dot whatever my cluster suffix is. I can just look up the service and it works. If I want to look up a service in another namespace, I can just say service dot other namespace and it will work because there's multiple search paths, right, for each piece of the um, DNS name. And then finally, you have options that you can set. So this is, if you're, if you're not a DNS guru, you can ignore this, but basically these are the ways that you can override what's in the resolve.conf. So step three, playing around with DNS. Let's give everybody, um, let's say, until 10 after um, to work through that. Seven minutes. Again, go ahead and work on your own. I'm just going to, for the virtual folks and for people who don't have a laptop, I'll just give you a preview here. So let's see. Did I clean up after myself last time? I did not. Let me go ahead and do that. So I'm going to kubectl delete some stuff real quick. All right. So on the DNS side, um, we're going to create a deployment again. And then we're going to expose it. This is a, a cheeky way to create a service. Right? It creates a service that's wired to that deployment, so it figures out what labels to use automatically. And now I'm going to run a client, and we're going to look around at how we can resolve the name uh, instead of the IP. 
So BusyBox image has to download. We'll let it do that. And the idea is, let's just try first to W. There's no curl in BusyBox, so we'll W get the website. And we're going to, this is DNS, right? I'm saying, hey, look up website. I mean, how does that work, right? How, how does that work? It works, but how does it work? Well, um, let's take a look at the DNS machinery, right? The first thing that we would want to do is look at the resolve.conf, right? Whenever your resolver, the, the, the part of the Linux library or the, you know, the, the, the glibc or whatever it is that's doing your resolution, it's probably going to a cache. If it doesn't see the name there, then it's looking in your Etsy hosts. If it doesn't see the name there, then it's going to DNS. So where does it find the DNS server? Well, there you go, myresolve.com. Recognize that IP? It's 10.96.0.1. That's our core DNS service. It's the cluster IP of our core DNS. Kubernetes eats its own dog food. Then look at the search suffixes. I'm in the default namespace on cluster.local. So when you make the name, right, if you, if you fully qualify it, and you say dot default dot service dot cluster dot local, right? That's what's happening, right? We're just adding that search suffix and it's a fully qualified name. It won't conflict with website services in other namespaces. What if I wanna to get to a website service in another namespace? Well, you can, right? You can simply say website uh, dot prod, let's say. Now that's not gonna work because I don't have a prod namespace, but you can see it doesn't work. Right? It, it would have worked if it was in default, but you said go look in prod, and there isn't one there. And so notice that this guy was resolving with service.cluster.local, the second search right, suffix. And then we have cluster.local and then whatever gets inherited from the host machines. All right, cool. So we, can, we, we now have the idea of like how the pod side of it's working, right? And I'm just going to exit out of this guy. And if we do a kubectl get all in the namespace cube system. You know, there's the machinery, right? In cube system, we have the core DNS deployment with two pods, and we have our replica set, and we have uh, the two pods up there. And then there's the core DNS service. So those are the pieces of the puzzle. All right, and the lab goes on, and it has you um, play around a little bit with some of this stuff. Then it has you create a headless service. Got a couple minutes, I might do that real quick. So I'm gonna go ahead and create this headless service. The special thing about the headless service over a normal service is that it has no cluster IP. And so you can see at the bottom here, cluster IP none. All right, and then the lab has us um, take a look at the cluster IP service. We see that he's got no cluster IP. And then uh, we're gonna jump back into that pod and we're gonna do some NS lookups to see what kind of DNS trouble we can get into. So I'm gonna kubectl attach my input stream to, uh, what was it called, client? Client, there we go, okay. And so let's go ahead and try that NS lookup on headless website that we just created. And you can see, I don't get back a single IP, I get back all of them. There's three pods, I get all three of them. And some DNS errors, but you, you get the idea, right? So we did it, the lookup worked, we got the three pods. And you can see that these, these, these three pods, they don't have un unique identity. They're created by a deployment, they have random names. And so we just, hey, here are the IP addresses, if you wanna connect to one, you can. But the idea then is to take this to the next level where we put the headless service on top of a uh, stateful set. So that's this guy down here. Note that a YAML file can have multiple YAML documents. And that's exactly what's going on in here. We have um, the first part is our service, right? So that's just the, um, the uh, service without the cluster IP, right? The headless service. And then this is the stateful set. We're saying, hey, you know, we're gonna pretend that these Nginx guys are actually stateful. They're not, but it's all right. And now let's um, kubectl apply minus F, that guy.
now what we can see is we have the, um, we've got this uh, new stateful set called web state, right? And that web state has created a pod, web state zero. So the pod gets the name of the stateful set plus an ordinal. And if I cube CTL scale um, stateful set web state to replicas equal three, You gotta spell it right. Fortunately, there's a shortcut. All right, so that's scaled. Now, there we go, right? Zero, one, and two. So if we go back up and attach again to our previous guy, and then we NS look up web state. Um, let's, let's just do that. You can see that we get the lookup as always. Right, web state is in fact a service, but now what we can do is we can ask for a different kind of query. We can ask for an SRV query. Uh, is it equal? There we go. And you can see that over here, web state zero, one, and two. So we can identify these guys now by their actual names. And if we try to, for example, curl a specific one of them, we could say web state. I wanna to talk to specifically the NASDAQ guy, right? Because I don't, I don't, I don't want the, the, the New York Stock Exchange data, I want the, the NASDAQ guy, and he's number one. And curl's not found, so I'll use wget. And there you go, right? We hit the Nginx guy there. So that's, that's DNS in its various flavors in Kubernetes, right? And of course, I mean, as you guys know, there's, there's a lot more to know, but the lab does start you down the road, hopefully is, you know, pulling away the veil on some of the more confusing bits and the, the things that aren't obvious when you start off. All right, so let's move into our next section, accessing services from the outside. How do we get from the outside in? Keep working on the labs if you want. Let me in here. Um, so outside access can be performed in lots of ways. At the end of the day, um, there's host port and node port and a lot of stuff on top of them. Host port and node port handle 99.99% of the traffic flowing into a cluster, one of those two techniques. So what does a host port do? It's not a service. In a pod, you can say, take this port on the host and map it to the pod's listening port, right? And that will work. The problem with that is it's not very uh, friendly to the cluster, right? If you want to map port 80 on the host, I mean, good luck. What if none of the hosts have port 80 open? Your pod can't run anywhere. So it's not a great solution for your users, for us developers who are trying to deploy apps, right? You don't want to use a host port. It's for administrators, right? If I'm running, you know, SSH in a pod, well, yeah, I want it to listen on 22, so I might host port that or something um, for diagnostics or testing. But it's not for general use for users, right? What, what users should be using is a node port. A node port's a service, and it's a cluster IP. You get a cluster IP, right? It's like an inheritance hierarchy, right? Cluster IP is the base class, and, and node port is a derived class. All the cluster IP stuff you get, plus a port is selected from the node port range, like let's say 310, right? Three, 30010, so 30,010, I guess. Um, and that's your port. And every single host computer will now take traffic on that port and forward it to your service. So if you set up, for example, a load balancer in front of all the nodes in your cluster and direct traffic to that port, you will be reaching your service. And that's exactly what a load balancer service does. So the inheritance hierarchy continues. Cluster IP, node port, load balancer. The node balancer, load balancer is the most derived, right? It is a node port and it is a cluster IP. So inside the cluster, you can use the cluster IP, that's best. It's DNS resolvable, it's gonna load balance you, it's fast. Then node port, that's one hop, right? You go right to the pod. Node port is two hops, right? Because you have to first hit the port on the host and somebody's got to forward your traffic to the next hop, right? There are scenarios where you can have actually a user mode proxy like 
Kube proxy in some versions of Kubernetes will actually listen on all the node ports and forward the traffic. In other cases, it's handled by the kernel, the eBPF and stuff like that. But then ultimately, your traffic ends up being delivered to the pod, and the pod's probably not on that computer, right? Unless you know specifically, what, if there's 100 computers in the cluster and you're running five pods, you're only running on 5% of the nodes. If you pick a host and hit the node port, chances are your pod's not on that node. So you're gonna have two hops, right? You're gonna hit the host, and then it's gonna have to forward your traffic over to the machine that has the pod, right? And then load balancer, three hops. The load balancer, there's no load balancers built into Kubernetes. You have to have a plugin that stands one up for you. So Metal LB can be stood up and use BGP to, to create, advertise a virtual IP that goes to the node port or something like that. Um, you can also um, use things like, you know, the load balancers for your cloud providers and you know F5 has one. There's all sorts of load balancers out there that will plug in, but you gotta do it, right? Kubernetes is not opinionated. You pick your load balancer, and then when you set up your service, it it you know creates the event, and then if somebody wants to do something with it, they can. In our cluster, when you create a load balancer, it's gonna be uh, pending. You're never gonna get the external IP of the load balancer because there's no plugin installed. And so Load balancer is three hops. You hit the load balancer, which is a thing, a real device or a logical thing, right? And then it hits the node port on one of the machines, and then third hop is back to the pod. So it's a hierarchy, and each one's more expensive. So you know you got to decide what you want to do. Load balancers are nice because that you can give them a DNS name out on the internet, for example, and you might have a hardware you know replication of them. There might be like seven of them, so if one fails, you know HA and all that. So load balancers are good for external access too, but they're based on node ports typically. They get into the cluster through a node port. And then you have ingress. An ingress is a controller that runs in your cluster, typically has a load balancer or a node port service in front of it. But the thing about an ingress controller is, what if I have five services? Do you want to tell your iPhone developers, oh, if you want that, you connect over to here, and if you want that, you connect over to here, and then, oh, this part of the API is actually hosted over here. Not really, right? Microservices shouldn't be exposed outside of the context within which you're developing them. The external API deals with different language, different, different uh, semantics, different um, bandwidths, right? The internet is flaky and low bandwidth. Your data center is gonna be fast and reliable. They're very different worlds. The ingress controller can create a, kind of like a firewall, an adapter from the outside world to the inside world. You could have two services or eight, and then you could say, hey, if somebody has hits slash engine, send them over here. If they hit slash web, send them over there. And so an ingress controller gets rules that tell it how to send the traffic inside the cluster to the different services that are on the inside. So you might have a bunch of your little microservices with cluster IPs only. You don't want them accessed from the outside. And then you have an ingress controller that provides your public interface and it sends all the traffic to those guys behind the scenes. And it's the ingress controller that has a load balancer service in front of it. And only the ingress controller. It's the one way in, right? So you might create node ports on the fly to test things and to experiment if you're on the inside, but the outside world never sees those. What's a gateway? A gateway is a more powerful ingress controller. Ingress is a thing in Kubernetes. It's a defined framework. Again, Kubernetes doesn't provide one. You have to install one. And we're going to use Ambassador. Oops, sorry, Emissary. It used to be called Ambassador. Um, and so we're going to use Emissary for that. Well, guess what? Emissary does the Kubernetes Ingress framework, but em Emissary is crazy powerful and has tons of other features. It can inject headers. It can do you know, fault stuff for chaos you know, operations. It can do all sorts of things. And so it's a gateway. It's a super powerful way to provide a single place where all your traffic can come in. It can do you know, security stuff. Um, obviously, uh, TLS is even part of Ingress, but it can do some more advanced security things. So it's a very, very powerful tool. All right, so this is an example of host port, right? Where we have host port in the pod spec and then the container port. And if there's no host with that port open, your pod's pending forever until that port is available somewhere, right? So not a, not a great thing for developers or users, more for operators. That's a node port. You just ask for type node port, and then you can ask for the port that you want, but if, you, if it's in use, you'll get an error. If you leave the node port off, Kubernetes will assign you one from the range, just like with the cluster IP, as we saw. And then this is a load balancer, right? You just say type load balancer. That's it. 
right? In this case, this guy has two ports, right? HTTP and HTTPS, which is kind of common. And then you've got ingress. This is an ingress rule. This ingress rule says, hey, if somebody hits the ingress controller using the HTTP protocol, and by the way, ingress only supports HTTP and HTTPS, and they are using the route slash engine as their prefix, could be anything after that, then send them to the backend service called engine, that's the name of the service, DNS resolved, on port 80, right? Very simple, and you can, the developers can create these rules. I, my DevOps team can deploy the, can provide the deployment that runs my pods, the service that lets people inside the cluster get to them, and the ingress rule that allows traffic from the outside to route in. Now, obviously, I gotta coordinate with the other people so we don't have overlapping routes and stuff, but that's the idea, right? Let those teams be independent. And then the last thing is the gateway. This is an example of configuring a gateway. That's a custom resource definition. It's not part of Kubernetes, but Kubernetes gives you the ability to create your own resource definitions like this one. And this one gives you the ability then to do things like inject headers and fancy stuff like you know, control the maximum connections. None of that's supported in Ingress, but em Emissary is super powerful and has all these kind of advanced features, so we would call it typically a gateway. It also supports protocols that the ingress controller doesn't support. Ingress, only HTTP and HTTPS. If you want SCTP or UDP, you're gonna need a gateway. And so lab step four walks you through installing emissary and um, doing uh, some ingress and some gateway stuff. So you get a chance to work with the CRDs that emissary installs and the ingress controller standard Kubernetes stuff. Why would you use ingress if gateways are so much more powerful? Well, those specs I just showed you, those custom resource definitions are emissary custom resource definitions. If you later switch to something else, they're not gonna work. But ingress is a Kubernetes framework standard. It's gonna work everywhere. The Nginx ingress controller will take them. The emissary will take them. So if you can get away with just using ingress, it's portable, right? Not a bad thing. So you have to decide what you need. All right, what I'm gonna do is cover service mesh because we've got a little bit of time left. If you want to start on the emissary lab, go for it. Um, but I'm going to cover service mesh real quick. And I tell you what, um, we'll leave these boxes up for another hour or two. So if you didn't get through all the labs, you'll have some time there. And then you know, probably like after lunch, we'll shut them down, let's say that way. So if you want to work through lunch, you can. Um, so let's, let's hit the service mesh stuff. Service mesh functionality. I mean, We've got all this functionality built into Kubernetes. We've got the CNI, we've got services, we've got ingress, and now these gateways, and there's just so much power and capability from a networking standpoint. Um, and there is complexity, but you know, when you start poking around and looking at it in the labs here, you realize that you know, it's manageable. But what's left, right? Well, if you're a developer, and your boss is hammering on you about security, 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 do you really want to go back and instrument every single service you wrote with mutual TLS? And how likely are you to get that right anyway, right? And then you're gonna be, now you got another thing to debug and to manage, right? That alone right there is a killer, right? And then as soon as you do it, now all your customers are broken. They gotta implement, you know, on their side, the mutual TLS stuff. That's a pain, you know, in Java or C++ or Go or Rust or whatever. Well, wouldn't it be amazing if you could just flip a switch and inject a proxy into every pod that did the mutual TLS automatically for every single outbound connection and on the other side for everything that comes in. That would be amazing. And wouldn't it be amazing if those pods, so that you didn't have to, reported telemetry that says, I'm connecting at this moment in time, I've been connected for this period of time, ooh, I'm seeing these errors come back, and just reported that all to a central um, repository that you could open up in Prometheus and chart and look at and set alerts on. That would be amazing. And that's why service meshes are amazing. Those are the things that they do. They give you MTLS for free, communication metrics for free, communication policy. You can't talk to that guy, but you can't talk to this guy. And you can't talk to that guy on Friday, you know, or whatever, policy. Um, traces, fault injection, chaos support, advanced traffic management. This is what service mesh brings to the table. And there are a bunch of them to choose from. There are proxy-based service meshes. So um, this is the, the long-standing group, right? Your, uh, your Linkerd's and Istio's and open service meshes and so on and so forth. Um, and so those guys are well understood. Um, they're also nice because they operate in the pod sphere. 
They're not messing around in the, in the kernel or you know, down at the host level. And this means that the second your traffic leaves your pod, it's encrypted. And so that's nice, right? If you're running some sensitive workloads, who's, who are the administrators on those computers, right? So there's some really nice things about having a proxy-based solution. And then the other thing that's also nice about that is that, that you know, it's, it's not in your software. You can upgrade the proxy without messing with your software, right? They have different you know, life cycles and stuff. Then you have eBPF-based. So this is a little bit bleeding edge. There's some really awesome stuff in the, 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 the hopper there, but there's some downsides too. And the, the biggest thing is that I don't think you're going to see a lot of GA eBPF service mesh implementations at this moment. Soon, but it's a, it's a little early days there. Um, Cilium, for example, and others can provide that kind of functionality. And then library-based. What if you're using gRPC everywhere? Well, gRPC could do the TLS for you in its gRPC library, right? If you're using it on both sides, then you could flip that on. And gRPC just, um, I think, went GA with their you know, proxyless service mesh. And so you could use the control plane of a standard service mesh to talk to your gRPC libraries and tell them to do what they need to do to, to do the service mesh stuff. And now you don't have a proxy. So the proxy does add some latency, right? Um, so that's why the people who build their proxies build them to be crazy fast. Linkerd, which is what we're going to use, is super awesome and has a Rust-based proxy. So compiled down to super compact, fast, native code. And in Linkerd, is kind of famous for being the fastest of the, service, of the proxy-based service meshes out there. And it's also super easy to install and works really great. So the last lab, which I know there's no slide, lab five is going to have you install Linkerd and then start looking at some of the metrics, see how you can see connections and see them that they're secured. And it's really a, an amazing thing to see. And it's so easy to, to try out. So one of the shorter lab steps. So what I am going to do is say thank you a ton for coming. We do have another few minutes if you want to hang out to the bottom of the hour, but I think they will kick us out in like uh, three minutes. So feel free to keep working on the lab up until the last if you want to, or work on it for lunch. We'll leave the boxes up for a bit. And, and yeah, thanks a bunch for coming. Have a wonderful rest of your convention.